Hello, I'm Dr Richard Milne and the question I'm addressing today is can nettles swim the riddle of how plants cross oceans? Now, Urticaceae is a large family. You may only be familiar with one species, the stinging nettle, probably too familiar in fact. There are actually two and a half thousand species worldwide. They're variable in form, they can be shrubs, they can be trees, and they occur pretty much anywhere that isn't too dry or too cold. And in fact, that's what we're really looking at here. How did the family achieve this remarkably wide distribution? How did it cross oceans to get from one of these places to another? To address this question, we went collecting materials. So the lead author, Wu Zhengyuan, she's in the middle, uh, there's me in the hat there, and others from the team. Uh, we collected from China, she collected from all over Southeast Asia, and uh, we brought back material, and uh, we sequenced it, and you're now going to see uh, years and years of work compressed into a really very short animation. So all of these are species that we collected, we sequenced them, uh, we, uh, ex we extracted the DNA and sequenced it, and then we plugged it into computer programs and uh, calculated the phylogeny. That is the uh, family tree, the relationships based on DNA evidence for this family. And uh, so you can see just how many species there are, just how many species we gathered and examined. Uh, Gesnuinia there, that one's actually from Tenerife. I had a very nice week's holiday in Tenerife, collecting that and a couple of other things. And so there you can see some more species going in. And here we have a complete phylogeny for the family. Now, from there, we can start to address the question of how they got across ocean barriers. And uh, we're looking at nine different possible ways they might have done it, ways to cross oceans. Using a bird, on the wind, across a land bridge, using ice, human transport, on a floating tree, floating in seawater, a floatant, tell you what those are later, and finally as vegetable rubbish. To show you what comes next, I need to introduce to you another type of analysis, ancestral state reconstruction. This takes a phylogeny and information on the living members of a group, and it uses it to reconstruct what their ancestors are, are likely to have looked like, uh, assuming the minimum possible number of changes. So in this case, that uh, the minimum number of changes would give us a yellow ancestor. An alternative hypothesis with a red ancestor, well, that's going to require not two, but four a total of four changes, as you can see here. So that hypothesis is rejected in favour of the one with the minimum number of changes. And so you scale that up to a whole phylogeny. That's basically how it works. And as well as for um, characters like flower colour, it works also for geography. So now we're looking for the minimum number of times that oceans were crossed. And in doing so, we can calculate where things were, when, and which oceans they crossed, when. OK, and so we applied that to our huge data set. You can see here a, a little piece of it with different colours indicating where we think things were. And note the measure of time here. So we can use that to test one of our hypotheses, human transport. Was that how the family got around? Well, humans have only been around for something like a million years. And so if the family got all around the world thanks to humans, then it would have to have done all of its diversifying within the last million years because humans weren't around to transport plants 30 million years ago. Whereas this family has been crossing oceans for 60 million years, therefore we can exterminate that particular possibility. Human transport was not how urticaceae formed its worldwide distribution. Okay, and in fact, we can use the same principle to uh, test another hypothesis, ice. Because ice has only really been around in any quantity on our planet for two and a half million years. Uh, and again, most of the dispersals across oceans happened before ice came along as uh, sea ice. 
and also the family, as you can see, it tends to avoid very cold places. So ice can be eliminated as a possibility as well. OK, so let's have a look at the uh, timing of um, the dispersals across oceans. The family originated in Eurasia, we're pretty sure about that. You can see the time scale along the bottom here millions of years ago. Um, in the first uh, 40 million years, it dispersed out of Eurasia three times, and the fourth one at 38 million years ago. There's another, and there's another. So six dispersals out of Eurasia in the first 30 million years. And there's another one, there's another one. And uh, as we go on, the family is diversifying, and we start to see dispersals into and out of other regions as well. As the family diversifies, more and more dispersals, some coming back into Eurasia and going in all sorts of directions all over the world. So all of this we can tell from our data. But we still haven't got to how they did it. Now, let's look at another possibility, land connections. Now, if we go back over 60 million years, there were land connections existing that don't exist today. For example, between Eurasia and North America, until about 5 million years ago, you could walk from Alaska into Russia. But there aren't actually many urticaceae in North America, far more in South America and you could only get into South America over land within the last three million years. Uh, and most things that got into South America from Urticaceae arrived a lot earlier than that. Um, so based on that and other similar analyses with other regions, we can say that land bridges also are not important for this family getting around the world. This leaves us with these seven, sorry, six, possibilities, all of which require extremely improbable events in order to occur. So let's talk about probability. So let's consider a really unlikely event, like winning the Euro Millions, a 1 in 140 million chance. But if I play every week for a year, I can cut the odds down to a mere 1 in 2.8 million. And if I do that, for a million years, uh, then actually the odds drop to less than one in three. So if time's on my side, I can cut these odds quite substantially. So let's look at something even more unlikely, winning both the UK and the Euro lottery at the same time. You have to multiply those two probabilities together and you get a pretty mind-blowing one in 6.3 thousand million million odds against. OK, can I um, make those odds a bit more favourable? Well, if I play once a week, then per year, it's a mere 121 million million um, odds against. And if I keep doing that for a million years, the odds come down to 1 in 121 million. But I can cut those odds a lot further if I get some help if everybody in Britain, about 70 million of us, I think, plays once a week for a million years, then actually the odds against one of us winning it are down to 1 in 1.73 or 58%. So what you can see from this is if there's a lot of you and you've got time on your side, this kind of apparently unimaginable odds can be overcome. So if you've got a nettle and you've got odds of... Um, one in 6,000 million million against any given seed crossing an ocean. Well, each nettle plant produces a lot of seed. There are millions and millions, probably thousands of millions of nettle plants in Britain alone. And of course, they've been around for millions and millions of years. So these kind of odds can be overcome. They are overcome periodically through geological time, and so these remarkably unlikely events are actually highly significant in biology. So the question really becomes, which of these improbable events is the least improbable? Well, it's probably not wind. 
urticaceae seeds, here's what they look like in uh, magnification, and they're just not adapted for wind dispersal, and members of urticaceae, they tend to grow in damp, dark places where the seeds are unlikely to be picked up by the wind. So we think wind can be eliminated as a significant cause of plants getting around. But what about birds? Well, migrating birds would appear to be a good way of transporting seeds, but there's two problems with this. One is, because of the way migrations evolved, it tends to be a north-south thing. So here are different major groups of migration routes for birds, and you can see they're always more or less north to south. They're, they're tracking suitable conditions at different times of year. So for east-west um, transport, migrant birds are actually not very useful. Plus, if you're about, if you're a bird, you're about to go on a long journey. You void your stomach and you clean your clean your feather, feathers, which means that transporting seeds becomes very unlikely. Whereas very very occasionally, a bird accidentally it gets picked up by a storm and it ends up travelling by accident to somewhere outside its normal range, and that's how you get this paparazzi of literally thousands of twitchers descending on some co bit of Cornish coast to photograph some poor lost American bird that wonders what hit it. So there may have been occasional cases of a lost bird transporting an urticaceae seed, but on the whole birds probably are not a significant means of uh, transport for urticaceae seeds either. So we move on to this strange concept of the floatant or floating vegetation island. Okay. Floating vegetation islands or floatants are perhaps more familiar to us uh, from folklore and fiction. For example, Jan Martel's Life of Pi. However, they are real, as this video shows. So here you can see a floating mat of vegetation on the ocean. And uh, you can tell that it's floating, that it's not a fixed island because of the way the trees are moving. See how they rock mechanically from side to side. That's not the effect of wind. There's very little wind up here, but they're moving from side to side and that's the action of the waves that they're sitting on. So what's happened here is this mat of vegetation, it broke loose from the ground that it was lying on and it now floats as a result of air trapped in the soil. And these kinds of floating islands, they can actually make it out onto the ocean and potentially cross ocean barriers. It's unlikely, it's extremely rare, but as we've seen, rare and unlikely events can still happen. One particular floating vegetation island was sighted on July the 28th, 1892, and then again in August of that year, and again in September. And it probably originated from south of Florida, so it had travelled an enormous distance. Easily a floating vegetation island of this size could have crossed a major ocean barrier. Uh, and they probably... Uh, can transport animals to new land masses. And this may, for example, be how monkeys first made it to the Americas. But for plants, only plants of really wet habitats could become part of these floating islands, as they don't um, come from places where it's dry. And to test this, we can use another application of ancestral state reconstruction. So I'm going to use a hypothetical to begin with an hypothesis that tall species are better at crossing oceans. So we begin with the geography, we calculate what was where at which point in the history of the group, and from that we work out when oceans were crossed. Okay, now we get rid of the geography, we just need the um, ocean crossings, and now we map onto it tall and short. Okay, and we see when, it, when was it tall and when was it short, and crucially, when it was crossing the ocean, how many times when it crossed the ocean was it tall? And how many times when it crossed the ocean was it short? And we get a three to one ratio. 
and we compare that with um, the whole history of the group. So we've got a baseline here, and in this case, uh, for all the nodes giving us the whole history of the group, then actually it was more often short than tall. And um, putting that together, we see that uh, if it's doing long dispersal, long dispersing uh, nodes are far more likely to be tall than across the family overall, and that tells us that tall nodes have a much higher chance of dispersing long distances. Okay, let's apply that to real data. In this case, wet versus dry. And uh, across the whole group, urticacea is slightly more often in dry habitats than wet ones. But if you look at long dispersal events, that flashing area shows that um, long dispersing individuals through the history of the family are much more likely to have been in dry habitats uh, than actually across the whole family. So being dry makes you more likely to disperse a long distance. And that means that floating islands, where they have to be on wet conditions, are unlikely to be significant in the history of this family for crossing significant ocean barriers. What about being on a floating tree? Well, plants do occasionally get washed out to sea on a floating tree. They could have been on the roots, but generally it's epiphytes that were growing up on the branches. Well, we can do the same kind of analysis on epiphytes versus terrestrial species. And in fact, only 1% of urticaceae are epiphytes. And in fact, of those that have undergone long dispersal, 3% are epiphytes. So they're three times more likely to be epiphytes if they disperse long distances. But the numbers are still very small. So uh, this floating tree method is also very unlikely to be significant just because there are so few epiphytes in the family. And that leaves us with seawater and vegetable rubbish. So could urticaceae seeds make these colossal journeys from continent to continent in seawater? Well, to do that, they'd need to be able to stay alive and they'd need to be able to stay afloat. And these are things that we can actually test. OK, so that's what Yu Zheng Wan did. For long periods, she put the seeds in seawater and she saw what would happen. And the answer, first of all, is that a lot of them do indeed stay afloat across well over 100 days. Large proportions of the seeds were still afloat. As to staying alive, well, when you get to 180 days, some of the species, the seeds have died off, but many of them, they're still alive. OK, well, if you take that survival data and you combine it with data on ocean currents, you can get an estimate for just how far seeds could potentially travel. And if this looks unlikely, remember, unlikely things can happen given long enough. And here are some more diagrams um, showing just how far seeds can potentially travel in the period that they can survive in seawater. So... Seawater dispersal appears plausible, but there are additional challenges that have to be met by a seed dispersing across through the sea. It has to get onto land, it has to reach suitable habitat and establish a population. Getting onto land, well, there's various ways to do it, but um, one of them is extreme events like a tsunami or a tornado. When they happen, the, uh, they will greatly disturb the environment into which the seed arrives. Alternately, the seed may be washed ashore onto flooded land or a beach or a coast, which are already disturbed environments. Therefore, a seed, that a species that is uh, more adapted to disturbed conditions is going to be better at finishing a journey across the ocean than one that is not. And this allows us to test this ocean hypothesis in a different way by scoring our species across the whole of the urticaceae tree for how much they like disturbed environments. So if it's undisturbed habitat, it scores zero. If it likes it semi-disturbed, it scores one. If it likes it very disturbed, it scores two. And in this way, we get an average score for all the species across the family and going back to its common ancestor. 
and they score 0.979. So uh, that's a slight bias towards undisturbed habitats. But if we look only at those nodes that have undergone long dispersal, we get a score of 1.143. That's a significant difference. Those species that underwent long dispersal like significantly more disturbed environments than the family overall. And so that is evidence that liking disturbance makes a species better at dispersing, and that fits very well with a hypothesis of dispersal through the ocean. But there's another challenge to be met as well. It's got to establish a population when it arrives. And uh, that means going from one individual, one seed, to a full population. Now, it makes sense that uh, if you're a plant that has both male and female uh, flowers, then in theory, from one seed, you can self-fertilize and found a population. But if you're a plant with separate male and female individuals, like the stinging nettle itself, you're going to need two seeds, one male, one female, Adam and Eve, in order to found a population. And we can then test whether this is indeed the case, the theory being that Monoecious, uh, where they have male and female on the same plant, should be much, much better at dispersing across uh, long barriers because you only need one seed. So this is the distribution of those two traits across the whole family. And this is the distribution of those two traits across those that have undergone long dispersal. And yes, there is an advantage for being Monoecious, but it's really, really small. And nonetheless, nearly half of those that have undergone long dispersal are dioecious, requiring two seeds. And this really doesn't make sense if our bisexual species are self-compatible. But it does make sense if they are self-incompatible. And that would mean it can have male or female flowers, but it still can't fertilise itself because there's a genetic barrier to self fertilization. This hasn't been tested in the family to our knowledge, but I would bet a whole year's wages that urticaceae are self-incompatible, which means you would need two seeds, whether you're bisexual or dioecious. Okay, um, so how then, theoretically, you know, if it's a one in a million million chance to get a single seed across the ocean, then you'd have to square that probability to float two seeds across to the same location. But so is there a way around this? Well, yes, there is. And it's our final probability, our final possibility, which is vegetable rubbish. Now, where does this term come from? It comes from none other than Charles Darwin, who wrote a hell of a lot of books about interesting things. And uh, this is uh, from one of his books. And uh, basically what he's saying is that he has seen bits of dead plant floating down the river. He calls them floating vegetable rubbish. And the importance of this is that uh, when you've got a dead bit of nettle, it may have multiple seeds within it. And uh, these may float across. And um, whilst the plant can't fertilise itself, a brother may fertilise a sister. So a dead bit of plant fetches up on the shore, two seeds from it blow in land, they germinate, they fertilise each other, and from there we can establish a whole population. So my gut feeling is that's the most likely means for the nettle family to have crossed oceans by scraps of plant containing multiple seeds. Questions?